Hi, everybody. I'm Dawn Smallman, the festival director at the Portland Eco Film Festival at the Hollywood Theater. Um, we're glad that you're joining us here today on Earth Day. It's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And what an interesting time to have that happen right now. We hope that you're all staying safe and at home as much as you can and taking this moment in springtime to connect with your loved ones and to look at the natural world as it comes out and becomes more visible while people um, sort of settle down in an interesting moment in our history. We're excited to have these partners with us here today. Uh, we were gonna do this event as a live event before the coronavirus hit. And so when we started moving our uh, programming online, we said, hey, let's just do what we were gonna do in the theater here online here today. So today I'd like to welcome Mace Vaughn. He is the um, co-director of the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation uh, for, of their Pollinator Conservation and Agricultural Biodiversity Program. Welcome, Mace. Hey, thanks for having me, Don. We're so glad that you're with us. And also is Liz Robertson, who is the Outreach Administrator for the Xerces Society. Hi, Liz. Thanks for coming today. Thanks so much for inviting us. So we're um, here all to celebrate Earth Day and to talk a little bit about the film Microcosmos and what the Xerces Society does. Um, we're going to chat just for a minute up front, and then if you'll pause this uh, recording, you can hop over and watch the movie at the link below in this email. And then you can come back to this recording and we're going to have about a 15 minute conversation about the Xerces Society and the programs that they run there, the excellent work they do on behalf of invertebrates, pollinators, insects of all kinds, and um, then also ways to get involved in the work they do. They've got a bunch of cool programs going on. So um, Mason, Liz, can you tell us a little bit about the Xerces Society and what kind of work you do? Sure. Yeah, I can get started with that. So Xerces was founded um, in 1971. So we are a conservation nonprofit that's based here in Portland, Oregon, where we've been for the last maybe 30 or 35 years or so. Um, Xerces as an organization, um, uh, as you mentioned, focuses on the conservation of insects and other invertebrates. And that work really involves helping to open people's eyes to this amazing diversity of animals that most people overlook, but which play really important roles in nature and in our lives. Um, and it's been a real honor for me to be working at Xerces uh, for the last 20 years with amazing people like Liz and a number of other folks on our staff to build, um, in my case, a pollinator conservation and agricultural biodiversity program that works both with homeowners and backyard gardeners, as well as with farmers and ranchers and forest managers to learn how to create, protect and expand habitat that supports pollinators and pollination. So how do we get flowers and nest sites and all these things we'll talk about later on into backyards and onto farms um, but also all those other insects that do all the, you know, these amazing other things out there like, you know, eat crop pests or, um, you know, recycle nutrients or food for wildlife, all those birds that we love to watch. So it's, it's a really, it's a fun job and it's, uh, seems more important now than ever, as we'll talk about later on. Thanks. Liz, can you say a little bit about your job doing outreach for Xerces? Like what? What kind of things do you think the public is uh, most eager to know that they don't already know? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of my favorite things about working at Xerces is the amount that I've learned in the three years that I've worked there. Um, and I have a background in environmental conservation, um, but the world of insects and especially pollinators and beneficial insects was pretty new to me. Um, and the most exciting part of working at Xerces is getting to introduce that to the public and to farmers and to other organizations. Um, and I think that there's this really been this awakening in the last couple of years, and it's been really exciting for us at Xerces. Um, we've always had kind of a, a core following and insect um, enthusiasts can be found far and wide, but we're finding that everybody is starting to really understand this relationship that pollinators play um, everywhere in the world and how important that they are. That's great. A great intro for the film. So um, we hope folks will hop over and watch the 1996 groundbreaking film, Microcosmos. It was made by a pair of biologists who turned into filmmakers. 
uh, Claude Nuranceni and Marie Perrineau. And um, then we hope you'll hop back over here to this same file where we're gonna continue the conversation for about 15 minutes and talk more about their work. And uh, Mason and Liz are gonna tell us how to trick out your backyard to attract pollinators, how to identify different uh, invertebrates and insects you might see on your neighborhood daily walks. Um, and just cool ways to get involved in there. They have a bumblebee program doing bumblebee watching and counting. And uh, we're gonna talk more about that. So enjoy the 1996 film Microcosmos and we'll see you back here soon. Okay, welcome back everybody. We hope you enjoyed that amazing film. Um, I'm going to throw the first question to Mace. So uh, Mace, you mentioned to me when I talked to you before this interview that you had seen this film originally when you were uh, at a younger, I guess it was like 25 years ago this film was out, so at a younger place in your career. Um, and can you tell me a little bit, uh, seeing it 25 years later as a conservation biologist, what, what did it uh, make you think? Well, it's interesting. Like, so that film came out when I was a graduate student studying entomology. And you can imagine for all of us, what that film did so perfectly was to capture um, this really amazing diversity of animals that are out there. And the whole point of that film and what made it so exciting for us at that time was here are these animals that people are overlooking. Nobody's noticing that if you were to go out into that meadow in the countryside in France, or frankly, into a meadow in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, um, that diversity is there um, to be discovered um, and arguably to be protected. So the first thing I was struck by was just how wonderfully it captured everything from earthworms, um, you know, to dragonflies, to, to bees, to lady beetles, to praying mantids, to katydids. I, I mean, it was amazing. Like every scene was something different and reminded me just like, you know, of my own fascination. It kind of brought me back to a younger mace which was really fun. Um, but the other thing that really struck me was at that time, you know, we weren't, I don't know, society was starting to think about pollinators. They were starting to get concerned about um, conservation of things like the monarch butterfly and some of these things that Xerxes, some of these animals that Xerxes has worked on for years, but there wasn't sort of this groundswell of concern. And in the last five years, we've seen report after report come out that not just, you know, species tied to unique habitats or unique ecosystems, but species like the monarch butterfly, like bumblebees that were common, that are all over the place to see even common butterflies disappearing. That's something that's new in the last few years and where this film made me realize that even though a lot of those species were just our common meadow species in France, we've got growing evidence that even those common species are starting to see a downward decline. And that, you know, sort of on the one hand, I was totally, you know, buoyed by, oh yeah, I, this is part of what made me so interested in insects and fed that curiosity when I was in my twenties, um, but also a little bit sobering, like, wow, a lot of these common species are things that are, we're starting to see um, disappear. Yeah, it's been interesting reading, you know, during the um, quarantine, it's been interesting reading about all these news articles about how in Yosemite wildlife is coming back out into view in places that are usually so dominated by human visitors and things like that. Um, it's, I think it's, a, it's an interesting moment to peer deeply into the natural world. And that's part of why I, you know, chose this film to, um, to, to talk about because it, there's opportunities now for people who are have been forced to slow down and uh, you know t detach from the rush to nature of life to really look more deeply into what they see in the insect world and the wildlife world. Can you talk a little bit about um, how people can uh, access you know uh, besides of being in this movie w where these filmmakers take you way deep into the lives of these insects and animals? How do people, you know, kind of do that in their own day-to-day -day going going about their business, even if they are in quarantine? Yeah, oh, I mean, it's such an interesting question. And part of what got me a part of why I became an entomologist in the first place, and like for me, what opened that door is what, 30 years ago, I started keeping honeybees with a friend of mine. 
And what keeping honeybees forced me to do, didn't force me, but led to, to me being curious where they were going and what they were doing. And so I began noticing them, oh, let's see, let's go watch them on the flowers. And so as we had flowers in our yard, or as I would go for hikes with my wife and we would see flowers in the meadows and along the roads and trails, I began seeing more than just the honeybees. And so part of it is just opening your eyes, but focusing down and looking for things that are small and starting to notice details you maybe wouldn't notice before because you weren't looking for it. Um, and so honeybees are great. I think honeybees are, are nice, but really all of a sudden I started to see ambush bugs and wasps and all these other bees and aphids and then the ants that were tending the aphids just like we saw in the movie. And then the lady beetles trying to eat the aphids. I mean, all of a sudden by looking at these plants more closely, you can begin to notice all this other diversity that's quite possibly just right there in your backyard, but it takes kind of being open to looking for it. And, and what are some, Liz, you mentioned when we, we were first talking uh, to prepare for this interview, Liz, you, you put us in touch and we're going to put our viewers in touch with these same resources. So what are some good resources that folks here in Portland or folks anywhere watching this could maybe use to kind of um, help identify and, and learn more about what they're seeing in their backyard or on their neighborhood walks? Yeah, we've got some great monitoring guides that I've shared with you, um, specifically in Portland. Portland Parks put together these two really great pocket guides for one specifically for bees found in the Portland area and another one for butterflies and moths. And that's a great place to start for getting to know what's in your backyard and what you're seeing in your parks. Um, and on our website, we have pollinator plant lists for every region of North America. And those are exciting, uh, excuse me, for the United States and Canada so far. Um, and we're always building up those resources. Um, and you know, putting in pollinator habitat in your backyard, whether it's a planter box or whether you've got an acre is, is really the most important thing that you can do um, for pollinator conservation. And we also have um, a growing uh, resource of community science projects. Bumblebee Watch is nationwide and the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas is something that folks in Oregon, Washington and Idaho can take part in. And Mace, awesome. do you have anything to add to that? Well, yeah, tell us more about the Bumblebee Watch. How does, what does that actually entail? Do you want me to take that, Liz? Yeah, sure. So Bumblebee Watch is a program where um, you can sign up and go out in nature, go out in your backyard and look to see, try to take pictures of the bumblebees that are coming to visit the flowers, um, let's say around your garden or your front yard, or maybe as you're on a walk, you know, some plants that you pass in the landscape. And the goal of Bumblebee Watch is to help us to be able to understand the current distribution of bumblebees in the US and where we can to try to track, um, ideally find new populations of certain bumblebee species that are in decline. So a lot of this came from the, like this program came out of the fact that about 25 to 30% of bumblebee species in the US are seeing a very dramatic decline in their populations. And so, we instituted Bumblebee Watch as a way to get people out looking and ideally help us find new populations. So here in the West, it's the Western bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis is its scientific name. That's probably the species we're most concerned about that we've really seen disappear, um, you know, from, from frankly, most of the Western uh, United States where it used to live. So Bumblebee Watch helps us find these bumblebees that are in decline, um, but also just track other populations. And then, to really do this scientifically, um, the folks on our endangered species team at Xerces worked with partners at Oregon State University and other, other universities across the Northwest to institute the, bump, the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. And this is a special program where we divide the whole region up into grids and people adopt a grid where they go to, which lets us be very systematic in our monitoring, which makes it so we can have really good data on bumblebees. But um, I think the Portland grids have already been well adopted. So <laughs> that's where Bumblebee Watch comes in. It's a great tool um, to be able to go out there and look for bumblebees. And there are bumblebee identification guides to help you identify bumblebee species as part of, uh, as part of that effort that you can tap into. That's awesome. And so you mentioned honeybees before. And so I think most people are probably pretty familiar with honeybees and managed hives and things like that. 
but what can people be doing in their backyards to make their habitat more friendly for these other kinds of bees, bumblebees and, and non-managed for honeybee types? Species? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the easiest thing is frankly the most, I don't know, the most beautiful thing to do is to just add flowers that are good for bees um, to your yards. Like, to any place you can. Liz mentioned everything from a planter box, you know, even a big sunflower in a planter box is going to be feeding some bees that might be going by, um, or just having any sort of, um, yeah, any sort of flowers that we know are good food for bees. I think it's important to recognize that not all flowers produce abundance of pollen and nectar. So that's where the plant lists that Liz mentioned that you can get off of our website are really useful. Um, because that way you can choose flowers that are really good at feeding bees from bumblebees to honeybees to sweat bees to leaf cutter bees to mason bees to longhorn bees. I mean, there's just this tremendous variety that are in all of our backyards um, all across the Portland area. So creating, like putting lots of food out there and ideally things that are blooming now all the way through to the end of summer is really what's most important. Um, but you can also play around with putting nest sites out too because a lot of our bees are solitary. In fact, most of them are solitary, which means you have this little female bee um, who's nesting all by herself. And she's gonna, in the case of something like a mason bee, she's gonna nest in a tunnel. So she'll go into some sort of a tube and lay her eggs in there. A lot of our bees out there are ground nesting, um, like the tickle bees of Saban Elementary School, which is where I live. Uh, I live right across the street from Saban Elementary School. And there's a field, I was just out there this afternoon with tens of thousands of bees nesting in the ground and they're just all nesting by themselves and so to have you can be looking for those as you're walking through your neighborhoods they're these lovely harmless ground nesting insects that if you've got a yard with a south facing slope or nice sunny exposure uh, with good well-drained soil you probably have bees you know nesting in the ground right in your own yard. Do people have to worry about being stung? When it comes to the bees, no, uh, for the most part. For all, most of our solitary bees, you know, you, they're totally harmless. You can get right up close with them. They're not defensive of their nest. Um, so you might have a lawn with hundreds of them nesting in your yard um, in the lawn, and it's perfectly safe. However, if you have a wasp nest, like a yellow jacket nest, which has those distinctive, you know, wasps with those black and yellow stripes, um, that you might not notice now, but come July or August, you know, you might see a lot of them going in and out. They can be pretty defensive. And so that's very different from ground nesting bees. Um, and bumblebees too are probably a bee that it, they, unlike those solitary ground nesting bees, form a colony. They nest in a little, you know, nest in a group. They have a queen and a few hundred workers maybe. And while at the flowers, they're pretty much harmless. You know, you're, they're, you know, quite gentle. Um, if you step on or come up too close to their nest, they may want to check you out, but they don't nest in lawns uh, the way I just described that our solitary bees do. And what's the relationship between, you know, there, there's a, an American tradition of having very tidy yards and lots of mowing and leaf blowing and things like that. What's the relationship between having uh, that kind of tidiness level and uh, pollinator support or lack of support? Well, I like to think that we give people a really good excuse to keep things less tidy and to do less work. Um, so the problem is if your lawn is just this dense thatch of grass and it's only grass, you're not going to likely have bees nesting in it. You're certainly not going to have any of that extra food that, you know, that pollinators need. And this is where having some clover in your lawn, um, for example, can really all of a sudden add a whole new food source. Uh, mowing less often, which and letting that clover bloom, again, adds a whole new food source. And then, you know, in the fall, when you've got all those leaves um, that have fallen, you know, even to be able to rake some of those up into piles to have them around your yard as a place where bumblebee queens might crawl in and over winter, or a lot of our other beneficial insects might find a place to hunker down. Like having those untidy areas, like a pile of brush, a pile of branches, you know, a down log and some leaf litter. There are a lot of insects that want to live and actually feed on that leaf litter and live in that leaf litter that, you know, when the birds come back in the springtime, they're going to be looking forward to feed. Um, 
And it's also one less thing to have to do around the yard to put that all into the recycling for the compost, I guess. <laughs> awesome. What about if I want um, dragonflies? We have some amazing <laughs> dragonflies here in Portland, other places in the US. What can I do to get dragonflies? Closer to me. <laughs> Actually, the funny thing you can do is keep bees because I used to, when I kept bees, like the dragonflies would come from like Laurelhurst Park or someplace from far away and like come and eat my bees and then go back to wherever they were living, which would always kind of amuse me. I was like, oh, look, I'm feeding the dragonflies. Um, but if you go to our website uh, or actually follow one of the links below, I mean, you could build a, you know, a dragonfly pond. I mean, you could literally make a water feature that's designed to have all of those elements um, that a dragonfly might actually need. They live in the water, you know, they lay their eggs in the water. They spend most of their lives as nymphs in the water. I'm trying to think in the film, I don't think they showed any dragonfly nymphs in the film, which is actually too bad. Um, but they're gonna live in there eating whatever other little insects are in the water. Um, and so having different depths from like a few inches down to a, couple, a few feet, I mean, ideally a pond for dragonflies is actually, I want to say about 50 square feet. So they're a little bigger than probably most people could do in their backyard. Um, but it's always sort of fun to have a, a nice big water feature if you can do it, if you've got the space. So it takes a little work, but it's kind of fun. Otherwise, just supporting planting native plants, having kind of a nice sort of, um, you know, wildlife friendly yard, having a pollinator friendly yard that has a lot of insects that are growing in it. Um, and therefore attracting them and helping to build an insect population around your house. I mean, that's another way because those dragonflies go pretty far at night um, in the evening time, you know, just before dark looking for prey to hunt. And so it's amazing how far away from existing ponds they'll actually fly to feed. Cool. Liz, we're, we're looking, all of us I think are looking forward to the day that the quarantine is lifted and we're going to slowly get back to being able to do things together as a community. Um, can you talk a little bit about the regular events that you guys host as part of your outreach programs? And just so people know in mind when uh, everything um, comes back around, what are some of the ways they can connect with Xerces? Absolutely. Well, I'll start by saying that we're um, in the midst of launching a new webinar series to get us through this quarantine time and that connect with the folks that we're normally singing out at our events. Um, so stay tuned for that um, going live next week. Um, and then I want to note that we have staff all across the country. So even though we're headquartered here in Portland, Oregon, we have folks as far east as Maine and down in the south and a lot of folks in the Midwest and the central states. Um, and we do <clears throat> a lot of tabling at conferences, we host field days on farms where people can come out and do some of the monitoring we talked about, get up close with the wildlife that's out there. Um, and I just encourage you to check out our events page and follow us on social media to stay up to date and know that if you don't see something in your area right now, stay tuned um, and hopefully we'll be near you. And if you would like Xerces to be involved in an event you have, we have a speaker request form, um, which the link is included below, and we would love to hear from you. Um, and we look forward to seeing you once this is all over. Great, thank you, Liz. So we're hoping to have Xerces uh, attend one of our, uh, when we go back to having theatrical live public events, we're hoping to be able to come up with another film and partner with you again, so we can all actually meet each other in real life. Imagine that. <laughs> that right. would be great. Thank you, is there anything else? Uh, well, should we tell folks where the name Xerces, how to spell it and where it came from before we wrap oh, yeah. up? Anything else yeah. that you wanna say? I think that sounds good. Um, yeah, no, in fact, a lot of people ask, like, why are we, where does Xerces come from? So we are named for the first butterfly species in the United States that went to go extinct. So in 1943 in San Francisco, um, as development expanded for the Presidio Air Naval Base that was supporting uh, the war effort, um, they were they built up over the remaining dune habitat or the last dune habitat for that butterfly species and drove it to extinction. So when our founders in 1971 founded Xerxes, um, they thought let's name it after this butterfly as a way to honor this butterfly and to you know focus at that time on this you know stopping the extinction. Of, of insects and other important animals like that. Thank you, such important work. We really appreciate that there's organizations such as yours out there doing this. And thanks for the opportunity to connect with you and your good work. 
And so we'll have links in this email and we'll have links on the Facebook page, the Portland Eco Film Fest uh, Facebook page, the event. And also I'll put something in the main uh, Facebook feed and we'll have it on their website too. A bunch of links that Liz connected us with of the work that Xerxes does and how to connect more with them. And thanks for uh, coming out to the movie night, Liz and Mace and everybody who watched the movie. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone.